first of all, thank you so much for having me here. And uh, uh, second of all, uh, you know, I know I have a specific amount of time that I'm supposed to be spending doing this, but from just about every presentation up until now, um, there has been something that has totally twigged for me, and I'm thinking, oh, I should really include that story too, because <laughs> that would really that would really put this whole thing in context. Um, but I won't do that. I'll uh, I'll hold off, and uh, just do as planned. Um, and I will start by uh, introducing this guitar. Uh, through its backstory. Uh, in March of 1995, I was working at Harbor Front Center in Toronto, and I met this guy, George Rosani. Uh, George Rosani is a luthier, and the, the word uh, maverick came up earlier. Uh, and George is, is something of, of a maverick in the uh, luthier world in Canada. Uh, he used to live in Green Bank, Ontario, um, now lives in Pinehurst, Nova Scotia. And uh, you know, uh, not uh, not in the sort of top echelons of the uh, of the luthiery world in Canada, but sort of uh, at the edges and beginning to make a name for himself. He had a few famous clients that he'd built guitars for. Um, but what made him really extraordinary and why I met him was that he was at a DIY fair where there was the uh, make your own yogurt person and the uh, build your own patio deck person, <laughs> and uh, then there was this build your own guitar guy. And, you know, I, I, I'm one of those people who has a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of knowledge, a little knowledge about a lot of things. And so I kind of knew how cocktail party conversation went around guitar making. So I went up to him and I said, ah, is that uh, Brazilian rosewood, uh, Japanese maple, um, African deputy? And he said, yeah, you know, I don't really go for the exotic woods. It's bad for the environment. It's bad for local economies. And you, you don't really need them. The fact is that in Canada, we have some of the best wood in the world, and we don't really treat it with very much respect. We cut it down, we put it on the backs of trucks, we send it to the United States, they make toilet paper out of it and sell it back to us. At the time, he was uh, trying to make a guitar just using wood from his property. And I thought that was a, a, a brave, patriotic thing to do, um, partly because at the time, the whole idea of patriotism in Canada was very much on everybody's mind. And that's because coming up in October of that year was to be a referendum in Quebec on the issue of sovereignty. And the question was put before Quebecers, should we remain in Canada as part of Canada? Should we strike out and forge our own country? Now that to me was a really fair question. Um, it seemed to me that Quebec has uh, something that the rest of the country, with perhaps the possible exception of Newfoundland, really lacks, which is a great deal of cultural confidence uh, people in Quebec read their own books, buy their own records, watch their own movies and TV shows. Uh, a very robust cultural economy. Uh, whereas in the rest of English Canada, we mostly kind of uh, wring our hands about who we are. And so in this uh, great hand-wringing tradition, as the, as the debate was ramping up in Quebec over what was Canada all about, uh, we didn't really know what to say. We got on buses and we went to Montreal and we stood on St. Catherine Street and said, don't go. <laughs> but we didn't really know why. We didn't know what we were fighting for. And that left a kind of a vacuum. And into that vacuum crept this idea that it was really about red versus blue, that it was about Quebec versus Ottawa, that it was about French versus English. And that, to me, seemed to be a very bottlenecked kind of way of looking at the whole problem. As you know, the vote came down very, very close. 50.6% of Quebecers voted to remain in Canada. 49.4% uh, elected to forge on their own country. Well, so what was Canada really about then? Because in that whole debate, as everybody talked about uh, you know, the constitutional gnashing of teeth of it all, nobody talked about all the rest of the experiences of Canada. Nobody asked me in downtown Toronto what my Canada was. Nobody asked the newcomer what their Canada was. Nobody asked the First Nations people what their Canada was. Nobody invited this kind of discussion to define who we were. And all that we were left with was this red versus blue. And that struck me as a real missed opportunity. Because although the vote went in Canada's favor, we were still stuck at the end of it with the same question. Not only that, what we relied upon 
to talk about the possible answers were a very, very flimsy set of icons that we have depended upon <laughs> for far too long. You laugh because they're a joke. You know what, I actually, I don't have anything against coffee or donuts or beer. <laughs> Uh, or any of that kind of stuff. They're fine. It's just that they don't really speak to the reality of who we are as a people and the kind of diversity of experience we have and the diversity of history that we have across this country. They're kind of cartoons of who we are. And so I set about, with the inspiration of George Rosani in the back of my mind, to create a new symbol that would speak to more people, that would include more stories, and that would let us talk about ourselves in a more meaningful way. So you see a bunch of pieces here on the screen. Some of them don't look like much, and indeed some of them aren't. Some of them were hauled off the bottom of Halifax Harbor uh, in, uh, from wreckage. Some were picked up off the tundra floor in northern Quebec. Uh, some of them are very famous. Uh, what they all have in common is that each one of these things tells a story. And every single one of these things is part of one guitar, the six-string nation guitar. In fact, for the project, we collected 64 pieces originally. There's 63 in the guitar itself, a 64th on the strap. Um, I also gathered uh, some pieces that went into the case, which I'll show you a little bit later. Uh, we officially nicknamed the project Voyageur in 2008. So what I'm going to do here, rather than tell you about all 64 pieces, um, there is a book available that, that will do that nicely, and the website works pretty well, too. But I'm going to take you inside the guitar and show you just a few of these pieces. So this, of course, is uh, the province of Quebec, huge, huge territory. Uh, the bit at the top there is, is the Inuit territory known as Nunavik. Uh, Nunavik is sparsely populated, at least in terms of uh, people. There's probably about 11,000, a little over 11,000 people, but there's a lot of caribou. Um, there's about 800,000 caribou. Uh, estimates go up past a million. Um, and of course, that means they're a very, very important part of the culture and the economy and the diet uh, of, uh, of Nunavik. Well, I met a young carver named Charlene Watt from Kujuak and, uh, in northern Quebec, and she carved this little ulu for us. Now, uh, ulu, if you don't know it, is a women's knife uh, used exclusively by women uh, for cleaning hides and sewing and all kinds of things. This is just a little ornamental one made of uh, caribou antler and a couple of little soapstone rivets there. Well, she made us this little ulu, and it is now on the fifth fret of this guitar. The guy in the picture is Charlene's father, Charlie Watt, who's a senator here in Ottawa. Uh, not the hockey kind, the other kind. <laughs> Maurice Rocket Richard, top Habs goal scorer in the 40s and 50s, um, uh, broke all kinds of records, a revered character in, in Quebec, uh, and uh, the sort of source of much of their success. Unfortunately, he was thwarted in the uh, season of 1954 55. Uh, in March of 1955, he was benched, uh, given a season suspension. Um, by the League Commissioner Clarence Campbell, uh, who three weeks later showed up at the Montreal Forum uh, at a game and with his fiancée and instantly started getting pelted with eggs and vegetables. Um, tear gas canisters were thrown, uh, the police were called, riots ensued, spilled out onto the streets, and these were the famous riots of Montreal in 1955. Uh, of course, there was no way the Habs could win. They did make it to the playoffs. Uh, came down to seven games between uh, Montreal and Detroit. And in the last 20 seconds of game seven, Gordy Howe for the Red Wings scored the winning goal, uh, beating the Habs. Uh, the next year, of course, Maurice Rocket Richard was not benched. Um, and uh, so he uh, had another opportunity to uh, make good, because in fact it came down to a contest in the 55-56 finals, once again between Montreal and Detroit. Well, that game ended rather differently. differently. Uh, went five game series, uh, one in five games, four to one, by the Habs with Maurice Rocket Richard scoring the final goal in the final period, uh, winning the series uh, for the Habs. Now at the time, if you were on the Stanley Cup winning team, you got a silver platter um, if you were a player. Now, 
you know, I know a lot of kids today would say it's cool to wear a platter around your neck, but um, uh, just wasn't done then. Um, and the Richard family uh, thought a, a ring would be more appropriate. So there were no official NHL rings in 55, 56. So the Richard family commissioned one. This is the one they commissioned for Maurice himself. You'll see his number nine there, the Habs logo, his name, Canadiens, the Stanley Cup. There's a little depiction of the Montreal form on the other side. Well, my friend Dave Traherne bought this ring at auction in 2004 when the, uh, the Richard family was getting rid of a lot of memorabilia. Uh, he paid about $8,000 US for this ring before the Quebec government swooped in and bought the remainder of the lot. Um, I know his wife thought that was a mistake uh, to buy that ring. Um, and then he made another mistake, which was that he told me that he had done this. Uh, and I said, well, Dave, I, I got to get a piece of that ring. Uh, he agreed, and we went down to a young jeweler at Harborfront Center in the craft studio, uh, and she cut off a tiny bit of gold from that ring. You'd never know it was gone, and it's now right in the middle of the ninth fret. I actually like to think this looks like one of Maurice's eyes coming down the ice at you. You've got the, the border, the, the white of the eye is Moose Antler from Pick River First Nation on Lake Superior. The blue is Labradorite from Nain Labrador. This is Sarah Nasser. She's the young woman who did all the inlay work on the fretboard of the guitar. Pierre Trudeau was our 15th and 17th prime minister, a very charismatic figure, a controversial politician. Uh, and, but, but also known widely as an outdoorsman, great supporter of the national park system, and an avid canoeist. I knew that I wanted to reflect that part of, of his character, which was so uh, inspiring to so many people, uh, somehow in this guitar. So I went to the Canoe Museum, or I tried to go to the Canoe Museum in Peterborough uh, to get something, but it was under padlock at the time, bankrupt. Couldn't get in, couldn't talk to anyone. I had the good fortune of bumping into Justin Trudeau uh, a while later, and he said, geez, I don't know if we've got anything left, but you know, I'll, I'll keep my eyes peeled, and I gave him my number, and a short while later, I got this message. Hi, Joey. It's Justin Trudeau calling. Uh, I got your message, and the guitar sounds like an amazing project. Uh, my brother and I had a look around, and we found one of Dad's favorite paddles I think you can use. Uh, it's in kind of rough shape. Not much use for a canoe trip anymore, but uh, it may just sound fantastic in a guitar. Hope this helps. Keep in touch. Bye. That canoe paddle was cut down. It's now the tone bar just inside the sound hole on the top of the guitar. Um, What's been really extraordinary, literally, from the first time we took this guitar out in public, for some inexplicable reason, women want to touch it. <laughs> it's all the time. Does anybody know the story of John Ware? Nobody. And I would, was one of you once, too. In fact, the guitar was already under construction when somebody told me about John Ware. Uh, John Ware was born in South Carolina in 1845 into slavery. Uh, when the Emancipation Act was declared in 1863 in the States, uh, he moved to Texas, uh, where he learned the cattle trade and ranching and all that stuff. Uh, from there, he joined a cattle drive to uh, uh, Montana, Idaho, and from there, he went to Alberta. He's essentially credited with laying the foundation for the entire ranching industry in Alberta. Uh, he was an incredibly successful entrepreneur, very, very popular guy. Uh, fell in love with the Red Deer River area, built a cabin uh, there, raised a family. Died in 1905, 12 days after Alberta became a province, and it was the biggest funeral Calgary ever saw. And it's part of black history in this country that nobody knows, except for a handful of people in Alberta. Uh, his cabin has since been moved to uh, Dinosaur Provincial Park in Drumheller. I called them up. Uh, and they gave us a little piece taken from that cabin. That is now the top element of the pick guard on the guitar. Uh, the other, you'll see it's kind of this uh, stylized half maple leaf uh, there, the top element, John Ware. Uh, the outside part of the middle section is from James Naismith's house in Elmont, Ontario, the inventor of basketball. Um, the inset there is one of 38,000 wooden nickels uh, made from salvage from the third mate of the mist that burned in dry dock in 1955 in April. Um, 
and uh, then we stained both of those uh, with uh, red ochre from Conception Bay, Newfoundland. That's Mary March, the last of the Baotic people um, who were wiped out by the European settlers, and red ochre was their calling card. In fact, that's where the term Red Indians comes from. Uh, the stem of the maple leaf consists of four pieces. The one on the left is the top of Paul Henderson's hockey stick from the 1972 Canada-Russia series. Next to that is a piece of the Wildcat Cafe, the oldest building in Yellowknife, built in 1937 and still serving a fine meal. Uh, even today, we had a meal there this summer. Uh, next to that, a seat from the old Montreal Forum, and finally, one of Wayne Gretzky's hockey sticks. Uh, any oyster fans here? Yeah. Well, see, I knew I wanted something from the uh, from the P to represent PEI, or at least one of the things I wanted. It turns out there's five, but uh, I wanted something to reflect oysters, and so I went to Rodney Clark at Rodney's Oyster bar in Toronto, and I said, uh, you know, what, what, what could I get that sort of tells the story of PEI oysters, thinking that he would give me some piece of shell or some abalone or, I don't know, something, because that's frequently used for inlay, right? He said to me, you got to get something from Joe Lebob. I'll let Genevieve, his, uh, his wife, tell the story of Joe Lebob, but keep your eye on her right hand. In 1985 or 84, we went to the oyster festival, and I noticed they kept repeating, anybody wants to shuck oysters to register. So I told him, I said, you go, Joe, go and try it. You know, you never know. No, uh, he says, I can't do that. Anyway, I talked him into it, and he went up, and he paid his due, and he uh, registered. So that's the first time he... he uh, he uh, competed in the shucking, oyster, shucking oysters. Dad got sick, eh, Mom? Remember we... That's my dad. He, we loved the water. That's a good picture of him. David Banks was the champion the year before. And uh, three times they tied. It was always a tie between David and Joe. Anyway, finally the fourth time, Joe won him. And I thought the rink roof was going to fall apart. <laughs> Everybody was roared for Joe. Yeah, that's how he became an oyster shucker for Tyne Valley. So they sent him to Ireland. Well, the first time, he, he was more of their, uh, like he came sixth or seventh the first time. And the second time he went, he lost by two seconds. Second place? Yeah. That's the one that he won in Ireland. He had a sil uh, uh, crystal one. But Leave, it the Irish. Oh. Leave it to the Irish. You give you a beer mug for a yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Believe me, there's lots of beer being drank in there, too. Oh, this is Joe's favorite oyster shucking knife. So he kept those. He was always sharpening them, and he looked after them good, but since he's been gone, he's just been laying around in the cupboard. A lot of memories. That's, uh, that's the knife that she was holding. That's his championship oyster shucking knife that she gave us. And we found a place for it in the guitar, right around the strap post in the butt end of the guitar. I love to share this story because although there's prime minister's paddles and hockey stars rings, you know, you might not think it's a big deal to be a championship oyster shucker, unless maybe you're in Tyne Valley. And when we took this guitar back to Tyne Valley to the Canadian Championships at the Tyne Valley Oyster Shucking Festival in six, uh, everyone was coming up to us saying, um, oh, where, where's Pierre Trudeau's can canoe paddle? And where's Maurice Richard's ring? And, Where's Joe's knife? Everybody wanted to know. These are some of the oyster shucking teams from across Canada who were competing there, <laughs> who all had their portraits taken, including uh, Rodney Clark. Uh, and there's Rodney there. 
this, of course, is just only part of the incredible uh, Lebob family of overachievers. And uh, I'm glad we got to put this into Genevieve's hands before she died earlier this year. So, a lovely thing. Uh, as you know, down the road there in Montreal, you have to make a choice. Are you a Sanvia Turbagel person or are you a Fairmont bagel person? Well, the Fairmont uh, is uh, the, um, the senior of the two. Um, it, is, uh, it was opened in 1919 by Isidore Schlafman, uh, who was a Polish immigrant and the first guy ever to put sesame seeds on a bagel. Um, when you make a bagel, of course, you put it into the ovens on these big long paddles called a shiba. We got one of those shibas from the Fairmont Bagel Bakery. We cut it into a couple of very thin slices that are now right down the middle of the back of the guitar. Um, the other real estate here, most of it is occupied by the Convent of the Grey Nuns, the oldest building in Winnipeg. Uh, Louis Riel went to school there for a while. His sister was a novice there. It's now the St. Boniface Museum. That's all spalted oak. Uh, the two really dark strips that are kind of uh, cradle the bagel stuff are a door frame from the center block of Parliament. And uh, right down the very, very center is a strip from this grain elevator built by the Duke of Bors in Verrigan, Saskatchewan, 101 years ago this past summer. We took the uh, guitar back to the Fairmont. <laughs> we didn't let him put it in the oven. Uh, that's, he's actually a pretty decent guitar player as well. Um, here's the story I really, really want to share with you, though. Um, this uh, is a real picture of a real tree. Um, it, it had golden needles. It had no chlorophyll in it. Now, a tree with no chlorophyll should not survive. It should burn up internally. But this tree was situated on Haida Gwaii, uh, sometimes called the Queen Charlotte Islands. And Haida Gwaii can be a very cloudy, very rainy place for a lot of the time. Plus, it had a lot of tall trees around it, as you can see. So it managed to survive uh, for, for 300 years, and it grew to 120 feet tall. And it was also protected because it was a very important tree for a lot of people. Uh, it was important to the Haida people, who, uh, who believed that it contained the spirit of one of their ancestors, a small boy named Kid Kias. It was an important tree to scientists who came to study it from all over the world. It was an important tree for the tourist industry because people flocked to come and meet this tree and find out how it survived. And it was also an important tree for the Macmillan Blodell Paper Company. They owned the logging rights to this area, but they studiously avoided cutting into any part of this forest because they knew how important this tree was to the community. <coughs> Problem was there was a guy who worked as a logging scout for Macmillan Blodell. His job was to calculate yields, plan logging roads, figure out new places to clear cut. And whether he went a little forest crazy or had some kind of crisis of conscience or who knows what, he decided that it was hypocritical of the company that they would protect this one tree while they clear cut so many in British Columbia. So to expose this hypocrisy, he got into a kayak one night from Prince Rupert on the mainland and he paddled across a very dangerous stretch of water called the Hecate Strait. And down this inlet that they call the Yakun River towards Port Clements. And in the middle of the night, he took a chainsaw out of that kayak and he cut down that tree. It took three days for this tree to fall. And the Haida people that I met said that for them, this was like a drive-by shooting. They couldn't understand why anybody would do such a thing. And they vowed right then and there that they would never cut into this tree. They would let it return to the earth in spirit and substance by leaving it where it fell. And it remained that way for nine years. Until I met Dr. David Suzuki, whom you might know. Uh, we'd been corresponding a little bit. He knew about the project. And he said to me, I've been thinking about you. I've been thinking about the project. And I have an idea for you. Have you heard of the Golden Spruce? He told me the story that I told you, and he put me in touch with some people in the community. Uh, Gu Zhao, the president of the Council of Haida Nations, and uh, David Phillips, who runs the Bed and Breakfast, the real community connector, and Lucille Bell, who uh, runs the Haida Rose Cafe. And we began a conversation that took about 18 months and ended up with us going into the forest in February of 2006 with a carver named Leo Gagnon and an elder named Frank Collison. That's Leo there, Frank me, Sid Bob, and um, we were the only people ever allowed to cut into that tree. This picture was taken about two minutes 
after we hauled that chunk of wood out of the tree. What was quite amazing is we all stood there marveling at what we had done, um, talking for a while, and then eventually we had to leave. And Leo said, well, it's yours now. You've got to carry it out of here. So I hoisted this giant chunk of wood up on my shoulder and started walking the trail back to the car. And uh, Leo said, there we go again, eh? Another white man walking out of the forest with our stuff. <laughs> We went straight to a mill where we planed off this piece here. That is now the entire top of the Six String Nation guitar. It's truly the face, the voice, the soul of this project. That's Alois Yaxley, uh, David Suzuki's assistant, uh, David Suzuki's daughter, Severin Cullis Suzuki, and some of the other folks that we met when we took the guitar back to Haida Gwaii for the Edge of the World Festival last summer including Mo Ingram, who was introduced to us as a cousin of the spirit of the tree. We took it back to see Leo and what was extraordinary. We left most of the rest of that chunk with him. He's been making stuff with it, including this mask of Kid Kias from the wood that we left with him. And I really just wanted to show Leo what had become of the contribution he'd made. But when we put that in his hands, he started reciting to me where everything was. He knew everything about this guitar. It's pretty amazing. Um, we also took it back to see Gu Zhao. I mentioned him earlier, the president of the Council of Haida Nations and a very heavy hitter, uh, politically speaking. He's the guy who handles all the big negotiations, uh, resource management, land claims, et cetera, et cetera. And I never quite knew whether or not he was really a fan of the project or because he's a pretty poker face kind of guy. We went back to see him at his office here and uh, there was this meeting in progress. And, uh, Gu Zhao's gonna be a while. We waited, we waited. Eventually, Gujo comes down and he says, uh, he says, you know, I heard you brought that guitar back. I said, yeah. He said, um, it might be a good idea for you to come up and show it to everyone because we're in that meeting and it's getting a little bit tense because we're talking about money. So it might really help if you came and broke the ice. Well, as you can see, the ice broke pretty well. <laughs> Everybody had a good time. Um, this is Gujo here, who is also an artist and a musician. And I kept trying to put the guitar in his hands, and, and he, he kept shying away. And I thought, I still don't know how he really feels about it. The next day, we're at the festival, and uh, we've got this nice perch where we're doing our portraits. And uh, I could see Gu Zhao come into the, into the festival site. I see him walk everywhere but the entrance to our area. And I'm thinking, man, does he really not like it? Or Eventually, he comes up, and he gets his portrait taken. I breathed a little bit of sigh of relief internally. Uh, and then he said, you know what? I want one with you. So we had our portrait taken together. And then he went away for a while, and he came back with his daughter, and they had their portrait taken. <laughs> and then he went away for a while again, and he came back uh, with this guy and had their portrait taken. And then he went away for a while again, and he came back with these guys. <laughs> all in all, I'd say that uh, he must have sent 30 people up to get their portraits taken. And he said something at the very end of the festival uh, when he got up on stage and said, I want to thank Joey for bringing the guitar back to this community. I never realized how powerful it would be. And with this guitar, you've done something no politician could ever do. More on that in a second. Um, he's, um, he made me very proud that day. And as proud as I was on this day when the guitar debuted on Parliament Hill here in Ottawa on Canada, Canada Day in the hands of Stephen Fearing, first, and a whole bunch of musicians afterwards on that day, everyone from Amy Milan to uh, Kyle Riabko, Jean-Francois Bro, et cetera, et cetera. Since then, we've clocked about 220,000 kilometers going across the country, uh, visiting some of the places that the guitar has come from, uh, some of the great iconic people and places uh, of Canada. Um, this is a band called the Shaft Bottom Boys from uh, uh, that's Glenn Gould's piano over here at the Library and Archives, Stomp and Tom's Schoolhouse in Skinner's Pond, and the first uh, Hudson's Bay store in Iqaluit. But just as important as that kind of landmark idea is the idea that this belongs to Canadians, that this is a touchstone for everyone, however they want to see it, whatever piece resonates for them. So it's really about getting it into people's hands, uh, letting them experience it up close and personal um, in all kinds of settings. Um, we do a lot of school visits, and um, 
I'm always astounded by the kinds of things that the students come up with, everything from banners and murals uh, to uh, book reports and uh, uh, special library displays, history projects. We even had a, a class do a culinary arts class, did guitar-shaped cookies. Um, <laughs> but here's the really thing that really blows me away. This just uh, came out this year. Uh, on page 109 of the new grade 10 math book for Western Canada from McGraw-Hill, there is a problem about the guitar. <laughs> now, I was told there would be no math. Um, uh, however, I'm, I still think it's pretty cool. Uh, Police Constable Scott Mills from the Toronto Police Crime Stoppers uh, works with kids doing um, legal graffiti art projects. Uh, he was really excited about the guitar and passed that enthusiasm, enthusiasm on to a couple young artists named Kedry Brown and Jesse Pacho, uh, who proceeded to make a mural of this guitar on the back of Lee's Palace in Toronto. If you're ever there, just go down by the, um, by the Tim Hortons there, you'll see it. Um, we do have uh, lots of friends in high places. Um, <laughs> However, I have to tell you, none of them has ever done anything for us. As happy as they are to pose with the guitar, um, this project has never received any government funding. Um, uh, the Department of Canadian Heritage, uh, lots of people there patted me on the back for such a lovely idea and told me it was somebody else's department. Um, so that's been kind of a, a theme running through this project, sadly. Um, poor old Stefan Dion looks just about as comfortable there as he did on the campaign trail. <laughs> I don't even think he's left-handed, so uh, um, the real delight has been watching this guitar come to life in the hands of musicians uh, at concerts and cafes and clubs and uh, uh, all kinds of places across this country. What's really, really uh, a thrill and a privilege and an honor for me is to watch a musician pick up this guitar, play it a little bit, listen to it, find its voice, and then think about where their voice meets its voice, and there's nothing quite like that. Uh, thank you so much, Alex Houghton. Thanks for having me here. Uh, I invite you to follow the project in any number of ways. And just before I go, I'm going to show you those pieces that I promised you inside the case. Because uh, people are always saying, oh, I have a great idea of something you can add to your guitar. We're not adding to the guitar. However, the case presented some possibilities. So um, those are cut from a larger pair of Don Cherry's pants. <laughs> That's uh, one of Pierre Burton's bow ties. The blue there is from Karen Kane's tutu from 1972, when she won the silver medal in Moscow for her role as the bluebird in Sleeping Beauty with Frank Augustin. Uh, and then there's a little piece right here of canvas from the very first Stratford Festival tent from 1953. And, um, and lastly, this piece here, which is a collage made for me by the children of Nelson Mandela Park Public School in Toronto and the Regent Park neighborhood, which is undergoing a rather extraordinary transformation. A lot of those kids feeling a lot of anxiety about what's to become of their community, and they wanted to commemorate it here with uh, pieces from each of the schools in their neighborhood and uh, part of the batik they made for Nelson Mandela when he visited their school. Thank you so much. <laughs>